and I want to welcome you all this morning to, in taking the time to come and learn a little bit about safety measures that the district has put in place to protect our most valuable assets, which are our, which are our children. I'm going to now ask that our chair of the board, Ms. Kate Darby, come forward and share some remarks with you. Ms. Darby. Thank you, Erica. Um, the first thing that I'd like to do is just acknowledge the folks that are here today taking time out of their very busy days to um, support these efforts to keep every single child safe um, in Charleston County. We've got behind me, we've got a number of um, law enforcement. We have Chief Ritchie from the town of Mount Pleasant. We have Chief Reynolds from the city of Charleston. We have Deputy Chief Watson from the Sheriff's Department. Um, we have elected officials, Mayor Summey from the city of North Charleston. We have Elliot Summey from Charleston County Council. Um, we have a few people from our constituent boards, Ms. Dr. Helen Frazier and Ms. Matthews from D23. We have Dot Scott from NAACP. If I've missed anybody, I've apologized. So speak up if I've missed anybody representing a particular area. It's great to have you all here. Um, many times, particularly in this past year, parents have reached out to school board members and staff concerned about school and student safety. Um, certainly after the tragedy at Parkland, we heard from even more parents. And they wanted to know what we were doing to ensure that every one of our students was safe. Um, some were ready to lock down every part of the school. Others wanted to um, not have so much, uh, they wanted their children to be able to enjoy school while also being safe. We had people with suggestions and people volunteering to help. So we wanted to take this opportunity today to reassure our parents, our students, and our taxpayers that school safety remains our top priority. If our students do not feel safe or are not safe, they cannot learn. We are so proud that we have made significant investments over the past several years to enhance our layered school security program based on lessons learned, technology advances, and lots of discussion with our partners in law enforcement, we have done a lot. Most notably, we have a systematic replacement program in place for all our major systems to include bus cameras, doors and hardware, campus camera systems, and perimeter fencing. For example, this summer alone, 60 bus camera systems have been replaced and Building camera systems are being replaced on six campuses. In this year's budget, our board committed to a school resource officer in every school. This will take support from our law enforcement partners and all of our municipalities and the counties, everybody standing up here, have already implemented this commitment. I will say Mayor Summey was the first, the city of North Charleston was the first to have SROs in all of their schools, elementary, middle, and high. So we get much appreciated and that is our goal for next fall. Also included in the budget is a district search team that will alleviate the burden on our high school faculty of conducting random searches for contraband. After a lot of research and talking with other school districts and looking at best practices, we believe that this will be a strong deterrent for students to not bring illegal items to school. People and programs are just, part, just as important to school safety. District staff is working to improve school climate, increase access to mental health services, and create a consistent threat assessment protocol. We have implemented in all schools the multi-tiered system support, called MTSS, and positive behavior intervention and supports, PBIS, frameworks which identify interventions for students in need of additional supports. Through partnerships with MUSC and the Department of Mental Health, we now have access to mental health services for all students. During the 2017-18 school year, 1,332 students received services, which is an increase of 382 students from the previous school year. We have also developed a consistent threat assessment protocol that will be fully implemented across the district in the 2018-19 school year. It is a daunting task maintaining 5,500 cameras, 
1,550 electronic door access points, completing 1,000 emergency drills, and screening more than 300,000 visitors to our schools per year. But our district staff has been up to the task. Finally, we are also keeping an eye on new technology. Here to provide more information on an upcoming pilot project is Board Vice Chair, Reverend Dr. Eric Mack. Dr. Mack, I'll let you switch papers because I went to the wrong about that. Thank you, Chairman Darby. The unfortunate reality of the 21st century education is that there has been a significant increase in the number of tragic on-campus violent acts against students and against staff. At the top of the list of these threats is gun violence at, at our various schools, with active shooters coming on campus intending to do as much harm as they possibly can. But the terrible events at, that took place at Sandy Hook, Parkland, Santa Fe, and other schools show the devastating impact that an active shooter can have on a school and on its students and parents and the surrounding community. While the, the highest priority of the Charleston County School District and its Board of Trustee is safety and security of our school children and we are continually looking for ways to better protect our students. We cannot of course uh, divulge all of the measures that we have taken in the past and will take in the future, but to try and prevent violence at any one of our schools. But there are lessons to be learned from prior school shooting tragedies, and we have taken steps to do our best to never have such a tragedy happen in Charleston County School District. And one of those steps is, is being introduced today. We are teaming up with a local company, R2P Innovation LLC, on a pilot program designed to provide a level of protection to students not found elsewhere. R2P is in the process of installing a bullet resistant classroom door in several schools in the district, which will give us an opportunity to test a brand new technology with a goal of protecting our students in the event of an active shooter until proper law enforcement can arrive and deal with an active shooter. It, it is my expectation that following the pilot program, we will begin exploring the possibility of installing doors. And to provide more information, I would like to introduce uh, Tony Daring, CEO and founder of R2P Innovation. Tony has taken his many years of experience in protecting our nation's men and women in uniform and developing groundbreaking technology that can now be used to protect our nation's greatest asset, our students in schools today. Mr. Daring. Yep, there he is. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Madam Chair, uh, Reverend Mack, much appreciated. Mayor Sami, uh, all our law enforcement officials, uh, ele elected officials here, I thank you for the opportunity to stand in front of you uh, and talk about the product that we've spent the last four years uh, in developing. Thirteen years ago, there was a clear and present danger to our men and women in uniform. The biggest killer of U.S. forces and coalition forces in theater was the IED. Seventy percent of all U.S. fatalities in theater came from roadside bombs in both Iraq and Afghanistan. The pioneering company that sought out a solution and protected those men and women in uniform was here in Charleston, Force Protection. A lot of you folks know the company. At the height of production, they employed over 2,000 people produced many thousands of life-saving vehicles that went overseas and protected our men and women in uniform. I came here from South Africa to support that endeavor. Now, over the last four years, we've taken the experience that we gleaned in protecting the warfighter and incorporated that into a solution that can now address another clear and present danger and that is the ever-increasing spike that we see in active shooter events where high-powered, military-grade hardware is brought on campus and mass murder is committed. There's a reason why we've not seen more protected doors, bulletproof doors in schools. 
the technology does not exist to stop an assault rifle round in a door that weighs less than 500 pounds. This is a level 8 door, the UR752 scale, a commercial scale for bullet resistance. We see in the press a lot of talk of bulletproof backpacks and bulletproof windows, and folks have bulletproof cars. This scale runs from 1 through 8. 1, if you can stop soft nose 9 mil ammunition, pistol rounds, you can say that you have a bulletproof solution. This door has been designed to stop the highest level of ballistic threat in a school. It's a level 8 door and weighs just 260 pounds. And why that is important when you have young folk, six and seven year old children, being able to open a door, they need to do so effortlessly. So, we have a door that's 50% lighter, and then the development of the materials, the ballistic solution that goes into this door, it's now 50% cheaper than any level 8 door that's commercially available. So it's extremely discreet um, and can be retrofitted to existing school openings, school door openings. So we're very proud of the development that we've made and we're excited to work with Charleston County School District and we hope that with this technology Charleston can once again be at the forefront of providing protective solutions to the most needy and the most vulnerable, the young folk. So without any further ado, I'm open to answer any questions. How much will this cost the school district? Can anybody answer that question, the pilot project? The, the pilot project, the pilot project will not cost us anything. Um, RTP is putting the doors in three schools um, for us to pilot and, and they're covering the cost of that. Are you going to vote next month at your board meeting to put this in all schools? Um, I think based on what we've talked about with our security team, we probably need a longer time than that to pilot the doors. I think um, we want to make sure you know, they fit well, the kids can open and they can, they can stand up to kids opening and closing them all day, the hinges, the frame. So I think it'll be a little longer than a month for us to pilot them. If they, uh, I think we'll have them in place, I think in the next three weeks or so. So they'll be in place when, when school starts and we'll see how they go. And Will then- the door be in place at every entrance to, to the three schools? The, their, their classroom doors, the current door we're looking at, or, or you see here today is a classroom door. We've talked about front entrance doors, but right now we're doing classroom doors. And it'll be all classroom doors inside those three schools? It's not all classroom doors. It's we're, we're putting them in a couple of places in those schools. How are the pilot schools chosen? You can have the pilot schools were chosen. We wanted to do schools kind of across the um, district. Um, we've got a high school and then two elementary school. Um, the R2P staff came in and looked and, and, and worked with our security staff on what makes sense, what's a door that's going to get a lot of use, that, those type of things. And can you disclose what schools those are? We're not going to disclose which schools those are right now just because we want to maintain the privacy for those schools at some point. Um, you know, once the pilot's finished, we may be able to do that, but we, we really, we really, there are a number of things that we do security wise that we don't disclose just because it's, it's a way we can keep our, our students safe. And any chance we can know the price tag on a door like that, one of the classroom doors? The door is um, configurable to different designs, so variables would be the size of the window, the finish of the door, uh, dependent upon uh, the location that the door is being fit into and obviously hardware as well. So that's that's a variable, but a ballpark figure is about $4,000 per door, uh, dependent upon how the door is configured. But that, that does not include installation. What's it made of? If I could tell you, <laughs> <laughs> um, a secret source. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a highly resistant ballistic material that's been developed over the last four years. A lot of the work that we do is within the special operations community. Uh, we produce many thousands uh, of tons of ballistic product uh, throughout the year, 
uh, and have, uh, are still actively engaged within the defense sector, so the material is proprietary. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Darby, this might be a strange question, but the doors you currently have in place, do you know how much they run you? I don't know how much they run us. I know they're not $4,000. I mean, they're less than that. Um, and we're, we can find out. Erica will find out for us. Would the school district do an RFP process before choosing a vendor to put doors in every school? I mean, we always will go with the, our procurement code, which is the state procurement code. So yeah, you, you, we would do that. Just on, to go back to your question, I just want to highlight a point, and I want us to think back to 9-11. You know, post 9-11, I have no doubt that somebody had come up with the design of a cockpit door and a full body scanner. Um, similar questions were being asked. You know, it took the federal government 75 days directly after 9-11 to pass legislation for the formation of the TSA, which now employs 60,000 people as a $7 billion annual budget, and that's to protect 660,000 daily air travelers. So what cost would you associate with protecting the lives of 75 million students? See, when we talk about security, it's always after the fact. Mm. Never, never does somebody really become engaged unless you've had that phone call or being involved in an event like that? Do you see the validity of the solutions, whether it be a law enforcement solution, whether it be a camera system or a product like this? Um, but we've seen all too often, not 200 yards from this building, 2015, uh, the most tragic of events can, can come to the fore when you least expect them to. And we're talking about being at the forefront of innovation, and I think it's particularly impressive that it's coming from right here, local, Charleston County. Can someone um, touch on that? Yeah, so um, my primary business is at Pegasus Steel. We employ 260 folks, and um, we're out in Goose Creek. We have three facilities, and we produce product from uh, assemblies that go into nuclear submarines, and uh, mine-resistant vehicles, and, and bullet and blast resistant solutions for the US government. Uh, if the door project does, and I have no doubt that it will um, evolve, it would have a massive impact for the local economy. Do any other schools in the country have these doors yet? The they, they do not. Uh, as you know yourself, Harv, uh, you were at the launch 11, 12 weeks ago. So this is a work in progress, uh, and, and we appreciate all the commentary and feedback that we get from from you know, the folks out within the community. So we'll be the first in the country to have it. Absolutely. Quick rough and dirty math here. I mean, let's say there are 25 classroom doors per school. I don't know. Average. We have between eight, eight and 10,000 doors. I'll tell you that. Okay. Jeff knows the pistol. Eight to 10,000 doors. You can do the rough math. <laughs> yeah, so say we have, say the district ends up buying 8,000 doors, 4,000 a piece. That'd be a $32 million cost. Mm -hmm. The school board started these discussions last year, and one big highlight was you looked at metal detectors. Right. And you did sort of a cost-benefit analysis and said, you know, it, it really, for the cost of running these things and manning them, the benefit isn't really worth it. Will the district do a similar analysis to determine if you know, 32 million plus is worth it to install these in every Sure, yes, I think we will. And I, I'll say, you were there when we were talking um, about the metal detectors. Our security staff team, um, after the tragedy in Parkland, I mean, they went and reassessed everything that we were doing, and they presented a number of options to the board that they were, you know, thought would be helpful to us. That's how we got this traveling team that's going to be you know, doing searches at um, high schools. We've also, in the budget, approved having an emergency manager who will go and help every single school with their emergency plan, and if they have some kind of an issue, help them um, assess that. The metal detectors, we, we, we really did have a push to do those, but when our staff went out and did the research, the feedback we received from other schools was that the metal detectors were not preventing um, items from getting into schools and the best practices that that our staff found was it's much better to be doing random searches at the high schools on buses in the schools as a deterrent 
because with the metal detectors, you, you, you know, if you think about, you go through that process of going in the school, but if somebody can reach out a window and get something. So, I mean, that's why we made, made that decision was a, was a number of factors, what would cost. I think um, what we've talked about in talking with staff is that we're obviously in process of building or renovating a number of schools. I think if we were to do something with the doors, we would obviously phase that over over time based on what we were doing in schools. And if you follow things in Charleston County, if you went and went to a school five years ago, um, you would be able, on a weekend, you'd be able to go in to the playground and your children or grandchildren can play on the playground. Now, we've got perimeter fencing and the only people who are going into that school are people who have been approved or work there or, or students who go there. So there are lots of things that we're doing across the district to improve safety. Coming back to the search team, will mm -hmm. this be law enforcement officers or civilian district staff? Who, who's going to be on the, the search team? There'll, there'll be new people, new staff will be hired. They may have law enforcement backgrounds, um, but we, we, they have staff, that staff hasn't been hired yet. And what kind of contraband are they looking for? Weapons specifically, or are they also going to be looking for drugs? I, primarily, they're going to be looking for weapons. So let me just add that as we begin to look at the new technology uh, with the bulletproof doors, of course, if we begin to look back at the different shootings that have taken place, uh, a lot of the metal detectors were not the deterrent or, or the active shooter not getting in. But we learned that, that some of these students uh, that, that were shot were actually shot inside the classroom. So the question then become, what if we had bulletproof doors uh, uh, stationed in, in, in those particular schools? How many lives will we save? So if we go back and we look at the cost, and I, I always ask the question, well, well, where is the cutoff line for the cost of a life? You know, where, would, where do we put that price tag? So, so I understand that cost is, is, is an object uh, or, or at the forefront, but I also say that the lives of our students that goes to school every day is critically important to us. And with this new technology, we are trying to get uh, in, front of, in front of what may, may be an issue that could possibly happen right here in Charleston County. Uh, and, and at some point, we want to be ready. And prayerfully, it doesn't, it doesn't come our way. So they're bulletproof, I mean, but in terms of breaking into one, do they have a particularly resilient deadbolt or something? I mean, in terms of just like breaking into it. Right? So the door is not un unbreachable without the use of uh, HME, what we term homemade explosive. Uh, certainly the door could not be breached physically by a human person or breached ballistically. Any other when we talk about the $2.3 million that were approved for SROs, this, like for example, I know the pilot program is coming without a fee, but um, the contraband, those additional hires, is that being taken from that money? Or is yeah, that completely nope, that's all part. So the, the, the three big safety things we approved in the budget mm -hmm. were um, increasing SROs so that we have them at all schools, which we didn't have them at most elementary schools before, except in North Charleston. Um, and now Mount Pleasant put them in in the spring. Um, so that's getting them across the board. Um, the contraband kind of search team and then the emergency manager is the term I'll call. So the person who will help schools with their emergency planning. I mean, right now we have a very lean staff. And so this person will be focused on just working directly with the schools on their emergency planning. And in so, total, I know it's three schools. How many doors is there? To do what you want to so we want to keep it at the fact that it's three doors that's being piloting throughout those uh, particular schools. So so we want to know that that there will be a door, at least a door in each school. Yeah. So uh, but we want to keep it at that level for right now. So before we go any further, we, we do have one door at each school or a door at each classroom at three schools. We're piloting three different schools, but there will be at least a door in each one of those schools. Okay, so we want to keep it just there. But before we wrap up, we do have uh, our mayor here from North Charleston uh, who would like to, to say something to us. And we have county council here. We have our chiefs here from the different precincts that would like for them to say because the support of them here uh, just reinforces uh, uh, what we're trying to do as far as Charleston County is concerned and how we're trying to make sure our, our students are safe. Since uh, Sandy Brook, we put 31 police officers in schools in the city of North Charleston. 
Uh, that's to the tune of about $2 million per year that we spend to put police officers in our schools. A police officer is a deterrent. Uh, they're not a, a complete answer to the problem. These doors, in what I've been talking, in, in my opinion, is that it gives you time to get faster response. One police officer can't cure the problem. But the longer you can keep somebody from getting to these children is the key component. And we're talking about the, the millions of dollars it's going to cost. You break that down in a 10-year bond, you're talking about $500,000 a year. We've got 50,000 students. That's $10 per year per child. How much is life worth? I mean, we have to look at that. Th these are our kids, and we have to protect them. And I just salute the school district uh, for stepping up to the plate to start putting police officers in all elementary and middle schools and, uh, well, excuse me, the middle and high schools and looking at the elementary schools. I can tell you the relationships that are built between those officers in those schools and the people that work there and the young people that go there is unbelievable how it works for the whole community. It develops that trust factor that we have to have to be successful. And without it, it doesn't. And I can tell you that the school district, this is a big step for them. Uh, we furnish Dorchester County schools as well. High schools, we've actually got, and one as big as Fort Dorchester got two. But it's a relationship that builds. I went to an elementary school in Dorchester County with, to be principal of the day. Um, and I can assure you when I was a child, nobody ever thought I'd be principal of a day. <laughs> but I walked through with this principal and I was totally amazed. Every child we met in the hall, she called them by their name. I mean, I'm not good at that. And there was this young kid, about this big, sitting in the hall. He didn't put out of class. And she walked up to him and said, you know, what's going on? I got in trouble. I mean, so we took him down the hall to a break room, got him a Coca-Cola and a little snack, and was talking to him, and come to find out, he had been hurt at home the night before. He'd been hit in the head. And so his feelings had carried over into the school. And we were talking to him. The school resource officer at that school was on a trip going to a funeral where he was speaking at a funeral of his best friend's child who committed suicide because of bullying in the school. But she got him on his cell phone and he got on the phone with this child and by the time he got off the phone with him he was smiling, he was laughing, he was ready to go back in class because he told him when I get back you and I gonna sit down, we're gonna get a hamburger together, we're gonna talk and help you through whatever's going on in your life. So these police officers do more than just security. They work with people, these kids, to give them a better outlook on life. And when I went to my council and said, we're gonna spend $2 million, 31 police officers, putting them in schools, the eyes went up. I said, we'll make it with what we've got. We're not adding any people. Every one of the police officers that went in a public school in the city of North Charleston volunteered to go in that school. And the relationships that are built, the safety is the key factor in what they're doing, in anything they can do. To me, the amount of money that will be spent per child is more, is less than what we'll pay for toilet paper for the schools for the year. Okay? So let's put where our priorities are. The priority should be the security of our schools, students, and teachers. Teachers should not have to be talked about carrying a gun to school. That's, my wife taught school for 15 years. And, of course, I wouldn't have trusted her with a gun, but, you know. <laughs> but, but, but the bottom line is the safety is not teachers' responsibility, especially in a state. I read it yesterday, and I got so upset. The starting salary of a teacher can't be below $32,000. Starting salary for a police officer in my city is $42,500. The starting salary of the gentleman who's riding the back of my garbage truck by next year will be $32,000. So 
let's not put any more burden on the school district trying to keep teachers and hire teachers. Let's do something that's going to put them in a safer environment. And again, the security uh, people here in the school district, the board especially, is stepped up to the plate, and I want to tell them the city of North Charleston truly appreciates what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Watson. Does anybody else want to say anything? Chief Richie. I will briefly. Um, good morning, I'm Chief Richie, Mount Pleasant Police Department. The mayor said just about everything that needs to be said about what our officers are doing in the schools. And I personally appreciate the proactiveness our school district's taking. And if you look in this room, Charleston County is very special. We have strong relationships with the city, the county, North Charleston. Our all police departments work closely together. So if there is an incident at school, you're not just getting a response from North Charleston or the county or city. All these officers are headed to that school. So that's something that's going on from the law enforcement side of it. Where we train together, we work together, so it's seamless. There's no questions about what's happening if we, God forbid, we have an incident. Um, and again, things like the door or any security efforts we can do are appreciated or needed. And I love that that's being explored. But I think one of the biggest things that I just want to leave with this conference is kind of look at mental health. We cannot forget the mental health. Just this past school year, I knew of three incidents that, and Mayor, again, you talking about relationships our SROs have, where we had strong relationships with our student body who came to our SROs says, I think somebody may be planning something, or at least they're making comments or, or they're tweeting or they're Facebooking something of concern that allowed us to intervene, to get involved with not only the school and their counselors, but with mental health counselors to remove that threat. And again, have no idea if we stopped an incident, but at least we provided some mental health assistance to those young people. And I think you could hear other stories from other jurisdictions as well, but that's just Mount Pleasant. So, and you did hear it, we do have, um, all of our schools are now covered, our council stepped up as well and got the funding so we're providing our, our elementary schools with security. So again, appreciate the efforts, appreciate the proactiveness. We got a lot of work to do. And I think these partnerships with our students, when they see something, say something, or hear something, say something, is huge for us so we can get ahead of it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank hey, you. you mentioned a consistent threat assessment protocol when you're talking about the mental health issue. Who's, who's writing that protocol and who's gonna be trained in it? Um, so, um, I don't know if you know Jennifer Coker, who's um, the person who's in charge of alternative programs. She and her team have worked on, they are working, they're the reason that um, we've implemented the PBIS across all of our schools. So she'll be working with Michael Reidenbach and their teams, and then um, I think as many people as possible will be trained. Okay. Sure. Anybody else want to say something? Luther Reynolds, uh, Chief of Charleston Police Department. I, I think most of what needs to be said has been said. Uh, what I would just observe is a picture that you see here is a very healthy picture, and that is collaboration. Everybody working together, sharing ideas, focused on keeping our kids safe. It's a very complex challenge. It's not an easy thing. We need to be strategic about it. It's been referenced already that there's finite resources finite fiscal capacity. We have to work together, which we're doing, to do everything possible to keep our kids safe. The biggest thing that uh, we talk about is see something, say something. And what does that mean? It means that it starts with having a relationship, which has been referenced by the mayor and, and the, the, uh, the chair of the school board and everybody else today. We have to have trust among our staff, among our officers, the teachers, school security, and that's what we're working on every single day, building those relationships so that meaningful information comes forward on a regular basis. Every single day in our school district, there's an exchange of information, ideas, there's a strategy. Our officers are well trained, they're well equipped, but those relationships are probably the most important piece. So when that information is shared, that we act upon it, that we know at night, on the weekends, if there's things on social media, if parents have concerns, if the teachers, the principals, the staff from school security have a problem, that we react to that in a timely way, in an effective way. Internally in our police agencies, that our patrol officers, our SROs, our investigators, 
our command. Everybody's talking regularly because what ha can happen, and we know that there's indicators in a lot of these events that occur, pre-event indicators, things that are on social media, mental health issues, changes in behavior, comments that occur, emails and letters, things like that. When those things occur, we need to be tuned in, we need to react appropriately, and we have to have that relationship and that trust, and we have to have collaboration. There's not any one easy solution. Working together is the best effective way. There's a lot of data, there's a research that, that shows that. If we work together, if we're communicating regularly, we're gonna be a lot more effective. So I think we're doing that here. This is a, a show of that. If you could take a picture of this, this team together, put a frame around it. It's not about any one thing, it's about us collectively working together and saying this is the highest priority. We wanna create an environment where we're not invasive, we're not intrusive, um, where we're very careful about what we do in the schools, um, but at the same time, we create an environment that's safe uh, for our kids, not just in terms of crime and, and violence, but traffic and pedestrians and bicycles and all those things that are coming up that are gonna start in the beginning of the new school year. How are we talking to each other about all those issues and how are we focused on that so that we keep our kids safe so that they can learn. That's the whole purpose of schools. How can we work together to make sure we have that environment? Thank you. Thank you. Yep, and then we're gonna wrap up. I think we'll be around if anybody has any other individual questions. So we've talked about the price tag of a life, particularly a child in this case. There are no truer words that there is no price tag on a child, and I think we can all agree on that. But at the end of the day, you guys will have to be at that table agreeing on an immense amount of money. Can you tell us that you are committed to find and fund solutions to keep our students safe? I think that the two of us standing here who have voted to approve the budget this year and last year and the first year we were on the board that we are completely committed to doing whatever we need to do to keep our children safe. We're gonna have to be creative um, and I think we will continue to do that. There are nine of us on the board, so I can't, Reverend Mack and I can't speak for what, what they will do, um, but I think we are constantly looking at everything we can do from, from both the safety doors, as an example, to our mental health um, programs that we have in the school and we're going to continue to um, you know continue to assess what we need to be doing and be smart about the way we're spending money so, thanks and if anybody wants to I'm sure Reverend Mack and I'll stay around and anybody else if you all have any other individual questions so thank, thank you, you so very much. much for coming thank we you. appreciate it thank you